Yeah, busted this thing out. I haven't had this thing out in a while. This is my ye old Ibanez. Ibanez. I like it. I, I miss this guitar. I hadn't really been playing it. I busted it out a few days ago and I noticed that the strings are pretty crusty on it because it's been sitting for like two years I haven't been using it but I've been motivated to play <clears throat> I downloaded some music books I think I want to learn some new stuff and brush up on my my jazz licks I've been thinking about it I've been playing my bass for like two years now. It's like I only play bass pretty much, but now I'm busting the guitars back out. And I've been listening to a lot of music. Been sort of inspired to maybe write a new album, if I can get to that. I'm just uh, doing a lot of other stuff, you know. It's hard to focus on something like that when you've got other things going on. And, one of the things I've really been trying to focus on is my crypto and the market's doing really well I think uh, Bitcoin is I don't know if it hit all-time highs or not but it got pretty close at least so it's made me hopeful that I will soon break out of my wage cuck slave existence hopefully soon I'll Hit that escape velocity and I won't have to worry about working all the damn time. And I can focus on doing this, you know, making videos and playing guitar. So maybe I should do this right and start from the beginning. What's up, kids? I'm back for another episode. So this will be the fourth installment of Howard Sakhar's History of Israel from the rise of Zionism to our time. And um, I will go through a little recap of everything we've done up till now. I try to pare it down a little bit more each time so that we sort of come to an essential description of the book as we've come to know it. And... Um, we have a long way to go in the book, and right now we're sort of in this pre-Zionist period. And it's just giving a thorough rundown of the pre-Zionists, and today we'll go into Chovevei uh, Zion, and um, how that sort of sprung up out of Russia through the work of Leo Pinsker. So just take a second, folks. I can edit. I can edit the. Uh... Ugh. Hopefully, I don't die of like acid indigestion here. We're gonna go through the history of Israel, just in one afternoon. The history of Israel, from the rise of Zionism to our time, by Howard M. Sakhar. I feel like I haven't made a video in a really long time. You know, I kind of like my background here, though. I'm getting used to it, especially with the Ivanas back there. It's kind of cool. So the next video I'm going to do after this, I think I'm going to do the CIA stuff. I'm going to do Legacy of Ashes. I'm going to start doing casts of characters and start describing some of the people that are in some of the books that I'm going to be going into because it's important to lay a foundation. And maybe I'll put like little slides of like their image, like when I talk about them, like you can see what they look like. I have to do a cast of characters for Whitney Webb's book. When I when I finally get into her book, uh, One Nation Under Blackmail, I've got to do the cast of characters. And it's really important to do the cast of characters for the CIA stuff because in order to learn the history of the CIA, you have to understand like certain personages in that milieu to enable to to really understand uh, how they developed and 
what they were doing and sort of really how the agency was shaped and how it's sort of become what it is today. So right now we'll go through the history of Israel. I don't know why I have a hard time saying Howard M. Sakhar. Okay, so, so far I have discussed this book in episodes 7, 11, and 18. And this is part 4. To briefly sum up what we've already covered, in the grand scheme of Jewish history, this book begins with the scene of the Western Jews of the early 1800s being sort of sworn in, so to speak, according to traditional right, into the secularist European citizenry under Napoleon as a way of establishing equal rights under law for the new imperial establishment. The Jews were brought out of the ghettos but also out of their traditional and religious identity in order to assimilate them as much as possible into the fabric of normal everyday European existence. At least that was the plan. And so the lives and experiences of Western versus Eastern Jews are compared and contrasted. The Western Jews seem to be breaking more successfully from their oppression, however incompletely, as would later be revealed. But also from their traditional moorings, which would have more completely enabled their solidarity and readiness to commit to decisive action. The Jews of Russia lived under stricter, more oppressive powers which lent itself to a fertile ground for social and religious cohesion and stronger motivation to change their status once the going got tough. For them, it literally became a matter of survival. And so the Zionist movement started there with an underground intellectual movement of inspired writers and thinkers called Haskalah they focused on humanistic self-improvement and revived the Hebrew language for their everyday vernacular. They endeavored to unify the traditionalists and the secularists through a nationalistic approach, inspired by some of their European contemporaries. So this is basically the pre-Zionist movement of the 1800s. Peretz Smolensky and Moses Hess are key figures here. The aim was to establish strong Jewish identity for the purpose of creating the momentum and awareness it would require to obtain the financial and political support for a mass migration. They were able to enlist the help of the wealthy Rothschild banking family, among others. And of course, the Rothschilds were linked with the Rhodes Milner Group, which we will see turned out to be the final push towards the establishment of the State of Israel. Not that this is necessarily integral to this particular book, but I've arrived at this conclusion through other research. If you read Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American Establishment, the Jews of Russia got their final indignity and their jolt of real motivation once the new Tsar Alexander III instituted some reactionary counter-reforms and oppressive decrees against the Jews. His May Laws of 1882 encouraged open anti-Jewish sentiment and dozens of pogroms across the land, decimating the Jewish population there. Emigration became an existential imperative. Communication was achieved through the publication of articles and books. Many geographical destinations were considered, but Palestine was the common denominator of all discussion in that regard. In formulating strategies to ally with the Western Jews, because the Jews of the West required more cajoling, Zionist thinker and activist Leo Pensker 
expressed an optimistic view of the future. But his grand vision had collapsed with the anti-Semitic outbreaks in Russia, and he was driven underground for a time. In 1881, he traveled to Western Europe to try and rally support for some of his newer ideas, but didn't meet with much success. He published his book, Auto Emancipation, from Berlin that year, where he spelled out his ideas for establishing a land for the Jews. Because reliance on non-Jews to eventually accept them as equal citizens was not a promising proposition, and the window of opportunity would be fleeting. It was now or never. Their plight required recognized nationhood on any land on which they could settle. Now that's where we left off on episode 18. So, moving forward. With Leo Pinsker, the vulnerability of the Jews as a homeless people was systematically demonstrated. Jew hatred was analyzed as a complex social phenomenon bearing little relationship to education or progress. Pinsker's book, Auto Emancipation, struck a chord with its readers. The spokesman of the Haskalah praised it wholeheartedly. He quickly became one of the most admired men among Russian Jewry. For a time, he was at the very heart of the burgeoning Zionist movement. Pinsker would have preferred that the headquarters of the movement be established in the West. Russian Jewry was stifled by Tsarist restrictions. In his view, German Jews commanded the political influence and financial means to establish a national territorial base. But from 1882 to 1883, it was really among the Western Jewish aristocrats that Pensker failed to elicit a meaningful response. And so, he increasingly turned his attention to his eastern base. In 1884, he finally set about organizing his followers into a national movement. Okay, so the next section is called the Choveve Zion. By the late 1870s, before the outbreak of Alexander III's pogroms, Zionist study circles and clubs had begun to function in hundreds of cities and towns of the Pale. They called themselves parties or assemblies. They had different names, but were collectively known as Choveve Zion, or Lovers of Zion. Their credo was, there is no salvation for the people of Israel unless they establish a government of their own in the land of Israel. A few of these groups simply offered courses in the Hebrew language and history. Some established self-defense and cultural organizations. Zionism was illegal in the Tsarist Empire, and so meetings were conducted in secret. The Choveve Zion cause lacked centralization, and so it was slow moving. In 1884, Leo Pensker summoned a national conference of the various Choveve Zion societies. By this time, he was generally recognized as the natural leader of the movement. To circumvent the Russian authorities, the meeting was held in Katowice in German Silesia. With 34 delegates in attendance at their first gathering, they decided that the financing of the Jewish settlements in Palestine was their first priority. Only there could the people of Israel be transformed into a viable society and nation. The organization's central office was established in Odessa. As president of Choveve Zion, Pinsker was tasked with directing Jewish emigrants to Palestine. So this is in 1884. A lot of people think the Jews didn't show up until 1948. Ironically, Pinsker opposed a gradual approach to settlement. 
he would have rather fortified the Zionist ranks in Europe and then summoned an international Jewish Congress to place the question before the governments of the world. However, Pinsker didn't win the support he was hoping for at the Congress, and so he was obliged to work on a colonization effort, which he considered of minimal value. As it turns out, he underrated the importance of a piecemeal effort. They won a certain unofficial toleration from St. Petersburg in 1890, not with a nationalist organization, but with a society for the support of Jewish agriculturists and artisans in Palestine and Syria. To the end of his life, Pinsker's efforts regarding migration to the Holy Land were successful. Before his death in 1891, he was able to provide the Choveve Zion with a coherent ideology and an organizational structure and quasi-legalization in Russia. In the 1890s, the Choveve Zion grew quickly, even in Romania, Austria, Berlin, England, and the United States. By the time Theodor Herzl came onto the scene, he encountered a fully capable Zionist movement. 90% of the delegates who attended the first Zionist conference in 1897 came from the various societies which had sprang up around the globe. Although Zionism was a significant force by the end of the 19th century, it was still a minority within the Jewish world. Zionism originated in part from Jewish liturgy and tradition, where the messianic image of Zion remained palpable. Zionism secured itself with the Orthodox religionists by adopting several traditional Jewish holidays, celebrating heroic moments in Jewish history and observing Palestinian agricultural seasons. Flight from persecution was a key to survival after 1881, yet the Jewish religious leadership preferred to see Jewish refugees off to the homeland rather than tucked away in secular parts of Europe. Zionists drew inspiration from European nationalism and adopted from the Haskalah the Hebrew language and the notion that their plight must be undertaken rationally rather than fatalistically. This tough-minded pragmatism got them through to accepting Pinsker's analysis of their condition and exploiting the general East European Jewish mood for migration. The ideological enthusiasm helped them surmount the pragmatic difficulties they encountered in the actual settlement of the land of Israel. Okay, so now we're going into chapter 2. The beginning of the return, the link with the land. Sachar describes the village of Pekin in northern Israel, where an ancient synagogue stands, guarded by the Zionati family, whose origins trace back to the days of the last Jewish commonwealth. They are described as small, dark-skinned, and bilingual in Hebrew and Arabic. They are the embodiment of a physical Jewish connection with Palestine that never quite expired. So, although the Romans laid waste to the nation between AD 70 and 135, slaughtered upwards of 600,000 Jews and selling 300,000 into slavery, a few thousand remained in the country. They were heavily taxed and denied the right to visit their ancient capital. The survivors made their homes in Galilee. In the late Roman era, this decimated community managed a sort of revival, extending their settlements west. In addition, they were reasonably affluent and resourceful. During this period, the Palestinian or Jewish Talmud was compiled. 
Despite the Arab conquest and that of the Seljuk Turks, the Jews managed to sustain their population growth in Palestine, and by the year 1000, they numbered 300,000. This cultivation of their numbers ended abruptly, however, with the arrival of the Crusaders. By 1169, there were only a thousand or so Jewish families surviving. In 1187, the Sultan of Egypt defeated the Latin kingdoms, and within a century threw all the Crusaders out. Subsequently, under a Muslim regime, pilgrimages of Jews arrived from North Africa and Europe, mostly from Spain, the largest Jewish community in the diaspora. Well before the pressures of the Inquisition, around 5,000 Sephardic or Spanish Jews had established their majority among other Jews in the Holy Land, imposing their dialect as the lingua franca of Palestine Jewry. Yet, the Spanish Inquisition and the Spanish Expulsion Decree in 1492 sent tens of thousands of Sephardim into every part of the Mediterranean world, 8,000 plus into Palestine. Fortunately for them, they arrived about the time of the Ottoman conquest of the Levant, which happened in 1517, and their rule was unexpectedly benign. So, other Jews from the Mediterranean coastal areas made their way to Palestine as well. Many of them were Kabbalists, followers of the Zohar, a literature of Jewish mysticism that prophesied the final redemption of God's spirit in the outer world. The Kabbalists read into Spanish upheaval an injunction to return to the homeland in anticipation of the end of days. Many of them settled in the abandoned crusader city of Safed, which was near the tomb of Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, the Zohar's presumed author. In the 17th and 18th centuries, they were joined by migrations of Ashkenazi Jews from Central and Northern Europe. Ashkenazi is the Hebrew word for Germany. In addition, the majority from Europe called themselves Hasidim, or Hasidic, followers of the true way. Like many of the Sephardic, the Hasidim were devotees of Kabbalistic literature and regarded themselves as mystics, but more of like a charismatic style. The Sephardic and Ashkenazi newcomers increased Safed's Jewish population to 16,000 by the 18th century. Many pilgrims remained dependent on charity, but many of them took up trades. Okay, so we'll end this one here. I don't want to make it too long. These things have a way of dragging out, and it gets hard to keep up. So we'll end it here. All right, well, you guys have a good rest of your day, and I'll sign off now. Bye.